Lord, we need you this morning, amen. We need yes. the preacher to show up, the teacher to show up. The Lord wants to preach a message this morning. I pray that he would help me to communicate what he put on my heart. We'll go ahead and go to Matthew chapter 9. I'm going to let Miss Sandy handle the scriptures this morning because she does a better job than me. <laughs> amen. So we're in Matthew chapter 9. We're going to start in verse 1 and we're going to read all the way through verse 17. And then we're going to, we're going to uh, break down some of this chapter. Amen. It says, and he entered into a ship, talking about Jesus, and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy lying on the bed. I just want to say real quick about palsy. Today we use this word here. Uh, we use this word palsy in the in the in the Greek the word is where is where we get the word paralyticos is what the word is. And so it was described as paralytic. So the word, you know, whenever you say cerebral palsy, sometimes and I'm not trying to make fun, I'm just trying to give you a visual some people born with cerebral palsy had an oxygen injury to their brain when they were in their mother's womb, or a head injury can manifest those symptoms, and and they'll, their their body will twist and contort. Sometimes that word paralyticos can describe a portion of their body not working. You know, as a matter of fact, people that have cerebral palsy sometimes they have something else. I know in medicine, but they can call it hemiparesis, meaning one side of the body is paralytic. It doesn't move properly. So they limp or they can't move a particular arm. But what I notice in the New Testament when I read it is that many times these palsies, these people that are affected by the palsy, are, are is directly associated with demon spirits. Okay, um, and so he doesn't say it specifically, but many times when the Lord delivered people, I'm not trying to say that everybody that's got cerebral palsy today. It, that's not what I'm trying to say. But I'm saying in the New Testament when you see this a lot of times, Jesus is rebuking and casting out demons, and then they don't have this palsy in them, okay? <clears throat> so, this man was sick with the palsy. He was lying on a bed, and Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Your sins be forgiven. And behold, it's certain of the scribes. Now, a scribe was like a lawyer of the law. In other words, he knew the Bible or the Old Testament so well he knew every little jot and tittle. He knew every little letter. He knew every little concept, and he was ready to argue the word, the Old Testament word, at the drop of a hat. So here's this, but they're full of religion. You understand? So the servant of the scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemed And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, that's what you call it, the discerning of spirits, that's what you call a word of knowledge, amen, Jesus operating in a gift of the spirit, knows exactly what they're thinking and what's in their heart. He knows their thoughts. He says, wherefore, why, or in other words, why do you think evil in your hearts? What is easier to say, your, son, your sins be forgiven you, or to say, arise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. I just want to stop right there in case I forget. I want you to know that the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, amen, the, the Anointed One, the Messiah, has power on earth to forgive sins. I don't know what uh, other preachers in this town are preaching this morning. They might be preaching a much better message than me this morning. But I'm here to tell you, I see a movement taking place in the church. And it's not just starting yesterday. And it didn't just start last week. This has been going on for quite some time. People don't want to talk about the truth of the Word of God anymore for fear that it's going to offend someone. That it's going to offend someone and, and make them feel it uncomfortable comfortable. And then the next thing you know, they don't want to come back to church because of things that are going on in their lives that they don't want to let go of. I'm here to tell you, God's calling. He desires a man or a woman that would read the Word of God, that He could reveal the Word of God, and that they would speak the truth of the Word of God, no matter how you feel, no matter how I feel. <laughs> Sometimes when I read the Word, I'm like, oh Lord, you want me to be? Yeah, that's my Word, son. Yes, I know, right there. That what you just read. You know why it makes you feel so bad? Because you got it going on in you. It's my word. Don't monkey around with my word. Don't put your grubby fingers in my word. Present my word for the way that it is written. And then let my people do what they're going to do with my word. Amen? Amen? The Son of Man has 
So what is my point? My point is, people don't want to talk about sin no more. That's right. Sin is a problem, Christian. Wake us up. <clears throat> Not just so that you would be saved from your sin. Let me, if I don't say anything, I'm going to say a lot. But if you don't get anything out of this, leave with this. Sin is not just a problem when we run, walk in the front door. Yeah. <laughs> in other words, hallelujah, I walked in the front door. I didn't even know that there was this man named Jesus that died on the cross to set me free. He shed his blood on a tree on a hill called Calvary. And now I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Hallelujah. That's what I felt like the first time I walked up. I don't know. I tell my story all the time. Walked up there with my old long hair thinking I was going to be a rock and roll star. Couldn't hit a lick, couldn't sing a tune. And I don't know, I wanted to be. And guess what? When I stood up from that altar on that day, I felt like a cement sack had fallen off my back. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, I Thank felt so Jesus. free. For about two weeks, I felt so free. <laughs> Why? Because I started doing all kind of work, religious work. So, okay, we're not going to, yeah, we're going to get into it, but not right now. I felt so free. Sin is not just a problem when you first walk in the door and you learn about the fact that you, sin is a problem today, my friend. Sin is going to be a problem tomorrow. Every time you open a door and you let sin come into your life, what does sin look like? Sin can look like a whole room. <clears throat> fill in your blank of the things that the Lord has been dealing with you about. Fill in, your, fill in the blank of the things that I pray that the Lord would stimulate your heart this morning as I begin to preach the gospel without even mentioning it. Your particular little thing is what I'm talking about. That's what sin is. Sin is every decision that we make that is contrary to the word and the will of God. That's what the word sin means in the Greek language. It means to miss the mark. What I'm trying to tell you is this. I'm not trying to tell you that you got to live a life of sinless perfection. No, no, no. There was only one that did that. Well, two. Two men on earth lived a life of sinless perfection. You ready? I see all y'all's faces out there. This preacher's getting heretical. <laughs> only one died that way, my friend. Adam was born from pristine, formed from the pristine soil of this earth, and there was no sin in him. He was formed from the clay of an unfallen earth, and the life of God was breathed in him. And he was created in the image and likeness of God, and he had no sinful nature, but then he brought sin into himself, and he is the father of the human race, and all of us have sprung forth from his loins, and what does that mean? You inherited a DNA that is full of sin, my friend, a sinful nature that will drive you towards sin, but I'm here to tell you I got good news, because there was another one born, hallelujah, born of the virgin, born of the father, incorruptible seed, a plan that was in existence before the foundation of the earth, according to 1 Peter 1.18, God knew that Adam and Eve were going to fall, and God But every decision that we make, it's either going to bring us closer to the Lord or deviate us further away. That's right. And that's the truth. That's, right. that's the truth about the difference between sin and righteousness. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the truth that a lot of preachers don't want to mention. Mm -hmm. Because they would prefer that they don't come against things like alcohol or drugs or fornication or committing adultery or having sex outside of marriage or all of these other things that we talk about that the Bible clearly says homosexuality, my wife is wanting to know, dude, it's coming. They're going to just kick you off the of face. Well, who cares? Yeah. Lord, give me the strength to say your, to speak the truth no matter what they yes. That's right. I'm not saying I'm there. I'm saying, Lord, help me. People, oh, you hate the whole, no, 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 I love folk, my friend. I love them enough to try to tell the truth. Yeah. You're not going to convince me just because this world is changing and just because there's a spirit over this world that's trying to change the minds of people to believe a lie that this word right here is not the truth. Yeah. I believe right. that with all of my heart. Yeah. Listen, there's a spirit in the world that's trying to tell people yeah. that something else is true that's when right. this is true. And so most preachers, you know, at least the famous ones, and I'm not even going to, I don't feel sweet today, so I'm not even going to mention their names. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, I can't say that, Larry, because I don't know, more, you know, I can't say Mormons aren't Christians. What are you talking about, dude? Like, Mormons believe that, that Jesus and Satan were brothers. Yes, you didn't know that, but I studied this stuff. So I know what I'm talking about. Dude, that ain't the same Jesus. Did you not read your word whenever the Apostle Paul said they preach another 
another spirit, and there's another Jesus, and that it's another gospel. But that ain't just the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses. No, and that's not just the, the Jesus that Islam talks about. No, I'm talking about it. there's a different Jesus in the church. That's right. Yeah, I don't mean to call anybody out, but, well, I'm not going to say their name. So people in our church, they, 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 were, they were talking to me the other night. And the sister said we were going through some things. And I was going to this church. And she said, because I was going through some things, I started reading the Word. And she's like, man, as I was reading the Word, it's like the Lord's opening up my eyes. And I'm realizing that the things that I've been hearing are not the same things that I'm reading on the paper. That's right. And then she's like, I'm praying. Well, she said, I was praying for my husband. Because there was a lot of conflict going on. And then all of a sudden, my husband shows up in the church service. And one of her friends said, what's he doing here? And she said, what you talking about? Well, what's he doing here? He should be here. And she had told me, she said, well, the way she was praying was, Lord, don't save my marriage. Save his soul. Yes. Oh, thank you. And whenever he showed up and that woman said that, I don't know if she actually said it. I wouldn't be surprised. But what she was thinking in her head, <clears throat> the Jesus that I'm reading about in the Bible ain't the same one that you're talking about. Right. Where's the Jesus that the Bible's talking about? Yeah. I didn't mean to get off on this rabbit trail, but I'm here to tell you, that if the Jesus that you're hearing about in another church, because you might not like the way I preach, and that's, I understand, I'm getting more and more comfortable with that. I just want you to know. <laughs> I used to wear a long, long, and I'm like, I'm getting more comfortable. It's okay. Praise God. You, you can find another preacher that doesn't jab. I don't want you to. I really don't. I want you to keep coming. But I'm here to tell you, I'm going to keep proclaiming what I see written on these pages. I don't care how uncomfortable it makes people feel, uh, because it makes me uncomfortable sometimes. And that's what you call the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yeah. I still got people that comment on some of these videos. Now y'all think I should have tell me a lot of it. But the other day she said some lady commented on some Daniel thing you preached 10 years ago. Stop yelling, please. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't tell one lady she got on Facebook. She's like, I don't never go back to that church again. I don't want no preacher yelling at me. And I'm getting a bounce back when I was on Facebook. And I'm messy. You know, I'm like, lady, there ain't nobody yelling at you. I'm yelling at the devil. <laughs> I'm mad at the devil because he's been deceiving people for too long. Plus, I'm passionate. You want a sleepy preacher? I don't know. No, I'm mad about everything. All right. Sins are forgiven. That's what we're talking about. Sin's not just a problem when you first walk in the room and you give your heart to Jesus and you're saved. Sin becomes a problem each and every day of our life when we're just going to go in the wrong direction. But let's not preach ahead of the story, right? The sick of the palsy said, Arise, take up your bed and go into your own house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitudes, when verse 8, but when the multitudes saw it, they marveled and glorified God. Isn't that beautiful? When somebody's life is changed, it brings glory to God. I want you to know that. Yeah, All right. I can preach that for an hour. <laughs> Which had, because, no, let's just stop for a second. What about your life and where you used to be? Amen. I don't like talking about where I used to be because I realized, man, dude, I was. Because I wasn't even a good sinner. <laughs> I mean, I was a good sinner, but I was a bad sinner. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, man, why couldn't be like Robert? You know what I'm saying? I mean, like moving stuff up and down the Gulf Coast and got a black book and all that kind of. No, I was like a bum. Sitting on an air conditioner outside a convenience store waiting for some dude to show up and get me high, man. Like, really? And that was my life, dude. I'm just sitting there waiting. Come on, bro. Where are you going to go? You got a dollar, you got a dollar fifty, you give me a quart of beer. And that's where I was living. And I mean, and I mean that was the word. My point was it was a big old mess. And it didn't, I didn't ever plan that my life was gonna be that way. But God changes us, and he, when he changes us, he he he, he, he gets glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Where were you back in the day? And listen to me, the, the, the Lord ain't done with you, my friend. He's not gonna, he doesn't want to leave you the same in Jesus' name. He wants to change it. Hallelujah. He wants to get the sin out. He wants to wash it out. He wants to change the desires of your heart. He wants to change your mindset. He wants to cause it to line up according to yes. his word. And he will convince you. You hear me? If you are truly saved, well, what does it mean to be saved? You heard the gospel. You believe with your heart, not just your head. You believe with your heart. You confess Jesus with your mouth. Guess what? A miracle happened in your heart. 
You might still not be living right, but I'm telling you right now, if the Lord keeps drawing you back, if the Lord keeps drawing you back, that's a good sign that the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And he will not leave you the same. Yeah. He will. Hey, I'm saying, Lord, send the hounds of heaven, Lord. Yes. Go on me. Send the, send the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Don't leave us the same. Because let me tell you something, friend. If this, if this story is true, I'm telling you right now, it is. He met me in a ballroom bathroom after 12 years of being a Christian. And he spoke to me. I don't have time to get into that, but he revealed himself to me. I'm here to tell you this word is true. I saw him turn a light switch on in my wounded, broken, darkened heart that I had opened doors back up to. And I didn't know to see any freedom inside. I was about to walk away from the Lord and he showed up and I know why he did it. Now he wanted me to be able to tell you. You want me to be able to tell you, no, it's real. It is real, it is real, it is real. Jesus forgives sins, hallelujah. Not just on the first day, but yeah, keep on forgiving and keep on setting us free, hallelujah. And the more we walk towards him, the more free we're going to Amen. 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 Verse 9 says, and as Jesus passed forth from there, he saw a man named Matthew. I want you to notice that. He saw a man named Matthew. Sitting at the receipt of custom. What does that mean? He was a tax collector. I just want you to know that. And he says unto him, follow me. And look what it says. And he arose and followed him. Jesus, just simple words, follow me. And the word of God says, Matthew arose and followed him. Verse 10. It came to pass as Jesus sat at meat or sat down to eat in the house. Behold, many publicans and sinners came down and sat down with him and his disciples. Now, I'm going to make a quick point. He was sitting at the receipt of custom. That's terminology to describe the fact that Matthew was a tax collector. This word publican right here means tax collector. All right? That's just, I'm just telling you what I've learned through the years. Why is it important? Because context means everything. You gotta also understand what a tax collector was back then. Tax collector was the worst of the worst of the worst of sinners, according to the way the Israelites believed. Why? Because you see, they at this time they worked for Rome, the Empire of Rome. You, you, Jesus was born in the Roman Empire. Caesar was over the whole world from the east to the west. They allowed these small people group called the Jews to live in their little land. And they even allowed them to some extent to worship their God. But guess what? They had to pay taxes to Caesar. That's the whole point in Joseph and Mary going back to Bethlehem. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. You had to pay taxes to Caesar. So these publicans or these tax collectors, their job was to get Caesar his money. And they were given the authority by Caesar to make a little bit of something, something on the side. So what they did was they extorted their own people for extra gain and they filled their own pockets and they became very rich. See, that's the story of Zacchaeus, the wee little man. When he, he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. He was a tax collector. And the Lord said, get down from that tree, Zacchaeus, because I'm coming to your house today. See, the tax collectors were the worst of sinners because they extorted people and they were fraudulent and the Jewish people hated them. But what I want you to see is, is that when Jesus saw Matthew, the tax collector, he said, follow after me. The Bible says he arose and he followed after him. And then the next thing we know, there's a whole bunch of these kind of guys showing up to eat with you. See, I don't want you to see that. And you'll miss it if you're not really paying attention. All of a sudden, the tax collector gets saved, and then the next verse, there's a bunch of them in the house eating with him. But not just publicans, prostitutes. Sinners of the worst sort. They're sitting there, and they're eating with Jesus. Now, I've got to tell you something. Jesus is not being influenced by them, my friend. So if you find yourself in the midst of company that's still living a sinful life, I can give you a bunch of scripture that tells you you ought not be there. Yes. I'm talking about in close fellowship with sinners. That's right, right. There's a big difference between fellowship and association to some extent. <laughs> Meaning, well, what about my sister that still doesn't know the Lord? Tell her about Jesus. What about that person that I work with? Yeah, tell them about Jesus. If the office is going to eat lunch, whenever y'all go eat lunch, yeah. Tell them about Jesus if you get the opportunity. But do not go hang out with them at 9.30 at night when you know good and well they're doing whatever they're doing and it's not of the Lord. 
Yes. You're not supposed to be fellowshipping with dark. What fellowship does light have with darkness? I'm trying to help you out. Right? Yeah. I'm trying to teach you in a condensed 45 minutes to an hour things that it took me 15, 16, 20 something years or more. I've been a Christian. I don't know I've been a Christian. I'm 50. I'll be 55 in November. I'm old, dude. I got saved when I was 19. <coughs> I've been trying to serve the Lord for a long time. It took me a long time to learn some of this. Yeah. I'm just trying to help you out. You keep stumbling, you keep fumbling, you keep falling. Guess what? Part of the, you know what the Lord told me? Get out of Lafayette, son. Mm -hmm. Get out of Lafayette. <laughs> because all them people over there that you were hanging around with, I was telling my wife this morning for one split second before her and I were even an item, I got this crazy thought that I was going to go back and tell my old girlfriend about Jesus. And now that I was different, my life was going to be better. And I was going to get her to come on board. And you know what the Lord, I didn't even know what the heck I was talking about. Lord, forgive me for saying heck. I didn't even know what I was thinking or talking about about Jesus. But when I fought that thought in my mind, the Lord said, what are you even thinking? You're not going to go over there and get that girl to come serve me. No, you're going to go over there and you're going to be right back where you were when I told you to get out of there. That's Amen. right, that's right. That's right. Or when I did everything that I could possibly do to make you get out of there. <laughs> oh, there's another story in that, right? <laughs> you, you realize the Lord will start putting up that's some right. serious blockades yep. and road that's bumps right. and all kinds of stuff in your life to move you in the direction that He desires. That's right. Yeah. You might not even like it. You might come kicking the They go on me, Lord. They go on me. I don't want you, Lord. I'm like a two-year-old child. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do this. So guess what? The Lord knows what you need better than you know. Amen. Amen. I'm just Amen. Trying to say. Amen. All right. Let me keep going. The publicans, the tax collectors, the sinners that came down and sat with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees, oh, here we go. They're worse than the scribes. The religious leaders. When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why? Even if your master, or why does your master eat with publicans and sinners? Mm -hmm. Dude, I'm telling you right now, when I first started getting an understanding of the word of God, I was like, look at this. Mm -hmm. Jesus loves sinners. Mm -hmm. He don't like the religious people. Mm -hmm. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Yeah, that's better than, that's better than mm -hmm. what you respond. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. not I said, maybe not the way I said it, but that right there is better mm -hmm. than what you respond. Jesus loves sinners. Mm -hmm. he, ain't, he ain't too happy with that spirit of religion, mm -hmm. that spirit of religion will try to hold you down. Yes, sir. Will yes, try sir. to hold you down. That that spirit of religion is worse than the spirit behind crack cocaine. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you right now. I don't know because thank God I got saved before that stuff was popular. <laughs> but that spirit of religion will bind you and keep try to keep you stuck in a rut mm -hmm. and keep you in bondage. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. <laughs> you, you know, there's a lot. Boy, he said a lot right there. You might, not, you might not be catching it right now, but when Jesus heard them, he said, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. He said, See, the tax collectors and the sinners, they're sick. And they need a physician. Okay? But those that are whole, you know what he's doing is he's saying, mm -hmm. like you guys. <laughs> you think that that's not what he's saying? No, that's exactly what he's saying. Those that aren't sick like you guys with this horrible spirit of religion, it, it, you realize what these people did, these Pharisees, this is kind of ridiculous, but they would put something called a phylactery over there. It was a box. And it had scripture. And they said the bigger the box, the bigger... The, the more holy they were. And so they put these big old boxes and it would start to obscure their vision. The ones that were really holy, holy they called them the leading Pharisees because it obscured their vision and they were running into walls and doors and stuff and they had blood coming down their face. That's what they thought was holy. I'm holier than you. My phylactery is bigger than yours. I'm, I'm in church and I don't raise just one hand. I raise two hands. I'm singing loud to the Lord and you're just barely whispering. I'm involved in three ministries and you barely make it to church on time. <laughs> See what I'm saying? I mean, that's the spirit of religion. It's still alive in the church today is what I'm trying to say. I want you to be able to see that. Don't think more highly of yourself than 
what you want to, Christian. And listen, some of you are laughing because you know you don't want that. <laughs> right? I know I'm mad. I didn't do it. I mean, I had it. But I didn't even know it was wrong in me until the Lord revealed it to me. That I'm over here thinking I'm better than somebody else because I know the word better or whatever. All right, let's keep going. They that behold don't need a physician, but those that are sick. See, a lot of times people that are really bound up in sin know that they need a physician, right? 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 Sometimes we might not want to surrender, but we know that we know that we know that we need Jesus to heal us. Amen. That's why I'd rather talk to a sinner that's, that's coming to the end of their breaking point any day than a person that's bound with the spirit of religion. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and you'll know it whether it's... You'll know whether you're talking to somebody who's got a spirit of religion because they got an unteachable spirit. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's when Jesus said, don't cast your pearl before swine. Because yeah. a pig doesn't know what to do with a pearl. Right. You know what to do with a slop? But they don't know what to do with a pearl. They just mash that up in the mud. And mash it in the mud. What is a pearl? That's not a pig. The gospel is a pearl. It's a precious, precious thing. And if you're trying to share the gospel and you see that that pearl, and I'm not trying to call a pig Jesus. Jesus called the unclean. The unclean don't know what to do with her. All right? But go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride, bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then they shall fast. Now, this isn't even a part of our message, but because it's kind of like, what does it mean? I'm going to go ahead and try to explain it to you real quick. There over there, now the, what, it's still biblical to fast. Okay. To be led by the Holy Spirit. This was part of their Old Testament religion. People still today will make fasting a religious work. That's not right. Like what? They were making it a religious work. And they're looking at Jesus' disciples, and they're like, why do you not fast? Why do you not fast? And Jesus said, it's not time to fast. See, the bridegroom is with them right now. Talking about Jesus as the bridegroom. And, okay, I'm with them right now, but there's coming a day when I'm not going to be with them. And then moving into the new covenant, they will then begin to fast as the Holy Spirit leads them and guides them to fast. But you're still operating in Old Testament religion, but we're in the process now of changing all. All right? So he's coming against their religion. Now here we go. He's going to give further understanding about it. He says, No man puts a piece of new cloth on an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up takes from the garment, and the rip, or the rip, is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles. Other versions of the Bible say, trust wine skins. Neither do men put new wine into into old wineskins, or else the wineskins or the bottles would break, and the wine runs out, and then the bottles or the wineskins perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. So I'm going to take that passage of Scripture right there, those last two verses we read, as my title, If your clothes are ripped, he will give you new ones. Listen to me, Christian. If you're walking around with ripped up clothes, I got good news for you. The Lord wants to give you a new pair. Amen? What did he mean by that? No man puts a new cloth on an old garment. He's talking about transitioning from the old covenant to the new covenant. See, the, the patch represents the new covenant. The old garment represents the old covenant. When you put a new piece of material and you try to patch an old piece of material, when you wash it and that new patch shrinks, what does it do? It tears the garment even more because the two of them were not made to go together. You don't put new wine that's not fermented yet in an old wine skin because the old wine skin is hard and brittle. And when the new wine starts to ferment, guess what? It'll burst. The wine skin. See, what he's talking about again is, is that the old wine skin is the old covenant. The new wine is the new covenant. And that the two don't work together like that. So what does that mean for you and I? That when we get saved in the new covenant, which is Jesus, by the way, and the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of this vessel, he's not yes. wanting us to operate the old way in rules and regulations and objects. 
observations and law. No, he wants the new way where the Holy Spirit that's living in your heart begins to reveal the truth to you and begins to give you the power that you need. You need power this morning. I need power this morning. Lord, we need your help because we can't do it on our own. And when we try to do it on our own or in another way, it all just breaks down. And it doesn't work right. That's right. You know, the, the focus of this whole passage that Jesus is talking about is all about the new covenant. In verses 2 and 3, my point number 1 is this. He forgives sin. I know I've already ridden this horse all the way to the end of the race. He forgives sin. Amen. In verse 2 he said, and, and it talks about it. They brought a man sick of the palsy to him. And you know what Jesus does? He says, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Right? And what does it say? And behold. The scribes said within themselves, this man blasphemes. He forgives sin, but guess what? The devil doesn't want people sin forgiven. Can, can you work with me on that? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's right. Jesus forgives sin. This whole new covenant is all about Jesus forgiving sin, but the devil does not want people's sins forgiven. You know why? That's the first step towards freedom. Mm -hmm. When your sins are forgiven, that is the first step towards freedom. And if a person keeps moving towards freedom and light, guess what? Satan slowly loses his grip. Hallelujah. That grip slowly loosens the closer you get towards Jesus. The more freedom a person gains, the more the Holy Spirit convinces of the truth, the more excited they get for God. I'm telling you right now, when the Lord starts to move on your heart and you start to actually read the Word of God for yourself and the Lord, or listen to it on audio or however you put it in, and the Holy Spirit starts moving through the Word of God on your heart, Oh, an amazing thing starts happening. More truth is revealed, and then you start, by the grace of God, obeying those levels of truth that God gives, and you start experiencing more and more freedom. The devil doesn't want that. You know why? Because you start getting convinced in your spirit that this word is real, that the God, that this word speaks of is real, because you start seeing freedom in areas of your life that you couldn't have done. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. My brother knows. Amen. And you, and you start seeing freedom in areas of your life. You couldn't have done that. And then guess what happened? Oh, I mix a little bit of the Holy Spirit with that. Ooh. Now you got a problem, devil. Now you got a problem because now you got somebody on fire filled with the Holy Ghost that's going to be a witness for the kingdom of God and is going to bring glory to God. That's right. They got to quit worrying about living for themselves and they're not still wanting to live for the king. The devil doesn't want that to happen. Your sins are forgiven. He came to reveal and proclaim the truth. Amen? That's what Jesus came to do. I want you to just think about this, this scenario for a second. Jesus knows that when he says this, they're going to have a problem. Did you ever thought about that kind of thing? If, if you, I've read the New Testament enough times to figure something out. Jesus purposefully did things to rile the religious side. Well, what are you talking about? He knew that when he made, listen, when he made that, he took the dirt and he spit on it. That was against the law, according to the way they changed the law. They added their own 600 law. See, Jesus didn't have, Jesus could have said, blind man, now see. No. He picked up some dirt, he spit on it, and he made some mud. A little poultice. A little ophthalmic sack. Let's go ahead and stick some mud in his eye. That don't help, right? <laughs> so he sticks mud on his eye. He's like, now can you see? I see some, some look like some trees walking. Okay. <laughs> now I can see. Well, guess what? Now you don't broke the law. Because, see, you're not supposed to, to do any kind of work. And they come against them. If you go read the story, they come against them. They don't care that this man was blind for all them years. What about the day that he healed the man that was laying, laying by the pool of Bethesda? I think it's been a while. She was from the hip 38 years, I think that man was laying there. Yeah. Jesus said, will you be made whole? I will, but I can't get into the pool because everybody did. It's a long story. Jesus said, stand and pick up your bed and walk out of here. He, 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 why didn't he tell him to pick up his bed? It was the sound. So he picked it. He's like, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to pick up this bed because guess what? This, I, I mean, I'm just preaching it like this. This is my whole life. 
I was laying on this bed for 38 years. And guess what? I ain't going to be bound by it, but I ain't going to forget it either. The Lord told me to, to remind myself of where I used to be yes. and where he's yes. bringing me to. Yes. And guess what? As I'm walking out of there, what happens? Bed, I'm the Who told you to carry your bed on the Sabbath? They don't even care that this man was laying down there for 38 years and couldn't move. No, I'm here to tell you Jesus was over there to rile them up, my friend. Because he was coming in here. That's why he braided that whip and he beat them out of the house of his father. That was righteous anger. Because religion lies and religion holds in bondage. And religion doesn't want people to be free. And Jesus is over there saying, no, I got a righteous anger. I have a zeal for the house of my father. I have a zeal for the will of God that people would be free. Yes. And here you go, the, the religious folk. How dare you say that he's going to be forgiven of his sins? See, Jesus knew that this was going to rile him up. Because it's against the norm. It's against what people believe. And when people are set in their beliefs, they don't like to be challenged. But this is Jesus. This is his truth. This is his mission to bring light into darkness and to set the captive. I've gotten myself in a lot of trouble through the years. I'm not going to lie to you. I've prayed a lot. I've said, Lord, there's a possibility that the reason that I've gotten so many people riled up is because of my personality. Like, in other words... I'm too confrontational in the past, or I'm too this, or I'm too that. But Lord, and if that be the case, please change. Right? But if it's not that, if it's because I'm I'm pointing out things of your truth, because there's nothing better than going to a Bible college where people are still teaching their their congregants to walk in a system of works, and you come up in there and you start saying, Yeah, but what about this scripture here if we look at it from this way? And they never heard that before they get all riled up. <laughs> Because you're challenging their beliefs and they don't like them. <coughs> Amen. But whenever you begin to read the word of God and the Lord begins to reveal it, he wants it spoken. He wants people to be free. He doesn't want anybody to be under the bondage of a creature. Amen. You, you understand that? Amen. I want you to know that. Because many times in congregations, there is a spirit of control over the congregation. Mm -hmm. You need to feel free. That if the Lord says, go visit this church over here, you need to be free to go check it out. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that whenever you go over there, no, I, I hope that all of a sudden he's preaching the truth to you. But I hope that if he's not, you'll be able to discern the difference. Yeah. Yes. But as far as for you to be able to, you are the Lord's sheep. Amen? And Jesus is the great shepherd. Amen? And so what I'm trying to say, though, is that there's a spirit of religion and a spirit of control that tries to hold people down. You know? Uh, so Jesus tells the truth. He tells the truth even when the spirits aren't going to like it. Even when the religious folk aren't going to like it. Even though it will cause a stir, even though it's going to rob people of herald the truth, Christian, and turn on the light, Jesus came to turn on the light. And the new covenant people's sins are forgiven, and the guilt and the burden that paralyzes their body is removed. Amen? I want you to understand that. So, he had the palsy. There was a part of his body that wasn't working right. I listen, Jesus healed people physically. But I'm telling you right now, I learned it a long time ago, almost every time that he's healing somebody's body, he's really trying to preach the truth. Yeah. See, body parts of yours might not be working right. I'm not functioning right in the body, Lord. The Lord wants to deliver you. He wants to set you free so that you're no longer paralyzed and you can move and operate in freedom and liberty in the kingdom of God so that he can use you. This is point number two. I'm preaching long. Every step towards him is one step closer towards God's goal for your life. Matthew followed him. You remember that? I want you to see it. Follow me. He arose and he followed Jesus. Amen. I want you to look at this other scripture, if, if, if you could turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verses 9 through 10. Hebrews 11, 9 through 10. Listen, it wasn't just Matthew. Look how fast she is. It wasn't just Matthew. Abraham followed. Now, you don't understand Abraham. You understand Abraham was 2,000 years before Jesus? 2,000 years before Jesus. But guess what? Even in the Old Testament, God was revealing the truth that was going to bring people closer and closer to Jesus. The Bible says right here, by faith, it's talking about Abraham. By faith, he sojourned. 
Man, I was listening to this song the other day, and it talks, I wish I could sing. I try sometimes, I don't think I'm going to try this song. <laughs> it says, uh, talking about this life and the pain of life. It, it, the name of the song is Worth It All. It will be worth it all. Uh, worth the heartache and the tears. Work e worth every darkened night. Worth every pain. I'm kind of making up words now, but this is the essence of the song. Worth, worth, worth it all. Yeah. Worth the dreary days. Worth when the rainbow didn't shine. Worth it all. It's going to be worth it all. Then he's got this one verse in the song, and, and it won't really hit you if you hadn't really read a lot of the Bible. But so maybe you have, but it'll hit you if you understand the Bible. He's and then in the song, and this guy's actually from Baton Rouge. He's like a little, he's a little man. He says, lift your head, faithful pilgrim. Lift your head, faithful pilgrim. Lift your head, faithful pilgrim. What does that mean? It means you're on a journey, pilgrim. It means this place is not your home. It, it means that this place is a temporary state of mind. It means don't plant the tree, don't hang the painting. You're not going to be here that long, Christian. You're a sojourner like Abraham. That's right. Living in, look what it says, they lived in tabernacles. What is a tabernacle? A tabernacle is a tent. It means that they didn't have. There's nothing wrong with crown molding. I know I've already made that point. They ain't got crown molding hanging in their tent. Yeah. But I'm trying to make a point. Sometimes I see people and they love their yard so much, and if that's you, Lord, I need to love my yard more. But I'm just trying to make a point. But they're out there like you'd swear they're over there cutting it with some scissors. Oh, my God. People, oh, look at my children. Oh, look at my checkbook. It's, it's balanced. Too. Look at my car, how clean it is. I'm just trying to make a point. Clean your car. Balance your checkbook. Don't take my words out of context. <laughs> Raise your children. Then they would graduate from college. But I, what would it profit a man to gain the whole world? Yet he lived in his own soul. Abraham sojourned. And he lived in a tent. And he was a pilgrim in the land. Why? Look at the next verse. Because he, 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 why? Because he looks for a city. Yeah. He looked for a different kind of city, Christian. Hallelujah. It was a city whose foundations and builder and maker was God. Amen. Abraham had a revelation that you and I need. That this is a temporary state of mind. Yes. I need to quit getting put my roots so deep in this fallen earth. You know, you know sometimes in your own personal life, you're, you're, you're fighting the war. You know what I'm saying? Come on, help me out here. No, you don't have to raise your hand. Let me raise my hand for you. Mm -hmm. How many times have I contended with the Most High? Mm -hmm. I love the Word of God. The Lord said, will the potter, will the clay say to the potter? <laughs> Think about that. The clay is going to back talk the potter. Now, let me tell you something. I will cause you to get all discombobulated and distorted upon this wheel of life that I'm turning as I'm over here trying to add a little water and mold you and make you look all pretty so you can be a vessel that my spirit can live in. And the clay's going to talk back to the potter. I will cause you to spin a skew, my friend. You'd be all dilapidated and lopsided on that way on that clay wheel. Because he told Israel. Jeremiah, go down to the house of the potter. When you see the clay is marred, let them know that I will take that more clay and I will make another beautiful thing out of that. So I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care how marred your clay might look this morning. The enemy of your soul wants to tell you that you'll never be a vessel, but he is a liar and the father of lies, and God knows exactly what to do with more clay. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you have a tent, Gilbert? You live in a tent, amen, or your address, something, something, Elmo Drive, and you cut your grass with scissors, and <laughs> dust everything out real nice. All I'm just trying to tell you is I don't know how else to explain it, and I can try to explain it all day long, and as hard as I can, but I realize that until the Lord caused me to realize it, nobody, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know how long it took me to realize it? I'm over here, 
I used to think that moving to Florida was going to make me happy. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, I mean, don't get me wrong, I like the beach. But I literally thought that that was the peace that was missing in my heart, even after I knew the Lord. Or I would move to the mountains. I can't even snow ski. <laughs> but no, I would look through the little lights and, oh, look, they got nursing jobs in Colorado. And they got nursing jobs in Florida. I could go move over there. No, lift your head, faithful pilgrim. Yes. When I hear that song, I'm thinking of the pilgrim, and he's walking through the journey of life, and life is trying to beat him up, trying to tear him down. Sin's breaking him down. But guess what? The word of the Lord, lift your head, faithful pilgrim. The journey will not be long. It won't be long before you'll stand your king, stand before your king, and you will sing to him this song. Hallelujah. It was worth it. It was worth it all. Every heartache, every tear, every night of darkness endured, it was worth it all. If you don't have a revelation of that yet, Lord, I pray that you give them a revelation. I pray that you let them know that we're not playing games up in the church. I pray that you let them know that the devil is playing for keeps, that he wants to destroy them. He wants to destroy their children. He wants to destroy this earth. He's bloodthirsty. Lord, I pray that your people come by your name. We yes. know that. Yes. That we be broken free from the bondage of sin, yes. from the bondage of religion, Hallelujah. and that we be set free yes. to serve our King and to be a witness for Him. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That's yes. good stuff yes. because it's the Word of God. Hallelujah. Jesus saw a man named Matthew. He said, Get up and follow me. And that's when He arose. He arose. Your choices matter, Christian. Every Single choice. That's right. I'm not trying to weigh you down. I'm trying to preach to myself. Every single choice we make matters. Every step you take has an effect. Matthew got up and he arose and he followed Jesus. And then the next thing we know, there's a whole household tax collector. <laughs> I mean, you got to be able to get that, my friend. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that when Fat Man at the River Rat ain't sitting on the convenience store air conditioner no more waiting for somebody to come get him high on some, some old <laughs> used up marijuana and the Lord to get up in his heart and do something in his life and, and, and get, put, a, put a truth in his mouth to let somebody know, oh man, I love it. I, dude, and you know what you do? But first off, you need to get filled with holy ghost. Yes. <laughs> get, yes. And listen, pray. Lord, give me more of your spirit. That's your thing. Amen. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit and then you start taking steps to move in the right direction to be a witness for the Lord, I'm telling you right now, he makes you so bold. It's, yep. it's, and it's some good stuff yep. to be bold for the Lord. Yes. And listen, you're not, everybody in here is not going to look like me. Thank God. <laughs> right? Amen. You don't want everybody walking around acting like this. <laughs> you're going to do it the way you would. That's right. Because yeah. you're an individual. Yeah. And he loves you. And he can use you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. If you're soft spoken and you got a sweet spirit about it, I think I got a sweet spirit. If you're soft spoken and you got a sweet spirit about you, God can use that. You know what I'm saying? You're going to say it different than me for the moment we speak in the same language. That's right. Amen. Amen. And God wants to get glory. Praise God. Matthew got up and followed him, and now the house is full of tax collectors and sinners. But the religious still doesn't like it. I'm going to move forward. I think that clock is broke. Oh, that clock is Oh, no, we're good. It's only 11 o'clock. <laughs> Since I played at 12, I don't care about that anymore. I don't even care about that anymore. I used to. All right. I'm going I'm to share this one scripture with you because this is the first time I ever broke this scripture down. But if you could go to Hosea chapter 6, verse 6 real quick. Because Jesus said that. Jesus said uh, in verse 13, you don't have to go back to Matthew 13, but he said, he told the Pharisees, go back and learn what I said to you means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I've come to call the righteous, not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He's re-quoting Hosea 6. Jesus is quoting an Old Testament prophet. And he says, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice. See, sometimes it can get confusing because when you come in here and you start preaching... When you say the message of the cross, people sometimes use the word cross. I don't even have to use the word cross. The sacrifice of Jesus. The finished work of Christ. The new covenant. 
Whatever you want to call it. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that sometimes when you see this, it almost looks like God saying, well, I don't even want a sacrifice. No, God doesn't want dead, tired religion. God doesn't want people just going through the motions. See, that's what they were doing in Israel. They were just going through the motions. Oh, they're going to offer up another sacrifice. Let's bring another sacrifice. They had lost the gravity of what it took. Their hearts had become hard. Listen, the first time you've got to lay your hand, this is what they have to do. Lay their hand on a sheep, a little innocent lamb, signifying that they were transferring their guilt to this little innocent lamb, and then with their own hand, take a knife and cut its throat and bleed it with its blood. Now, the first time you did that, surely that choked you up. Surely it meant something, but maybe after the 150th time, you become more. It's kind of like we can do whenever we're coming to church. Man, whenever I used to come to church, it must be the it, it, it might be the preacher, I'm just trying to say, but it must be the preacher. It must be the music ministry. It must be something else. Something's not right. But maybe it's our heart. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? Maybe we're just going through the motions of religion. Right? And, and that's what it, this is what this, the scripture is saying. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. I don't want your dead, tired, religious works. You know, when I think about this, God's saying, you know, do you want mercy from God? I know you do. I want mercy from God. What does mercy mean? It means that a mercy towards the sinner is that God does what's right for the sinner, even though the sinner didn't do what's right for him. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Does that make sense? Here God's saying, I want my people to have mercy. I want my people to do it. God, Jesus is re-quoting it to the religious leaders because he's wanting them to do the right. God just wants people to do the right thing. He's merciful, amen? He's not concerned about people going through the motions of religion. Their clothes were ripped, close quote, because they were sewing new patches on an old garment. The Lord wants us to wear new clothes. Look, in Galatians 3.27, I mean, you can turn there if you want, but... It also says something about it in Ephesians 4. It talks about the new man in Ephesians 4. And in Galatians 3.27, it says, you've been baptized into Christ and you've put him on. You got some new clothes, Christian. When you get saved, are you saved this morning? Amen. Amen. If you're saved this morning, you got some new clothes. And you know what your clothes are? They're Jesus. And while his body was ripped for you, those clothes you're wearing now, they're not ripped. They're white. And they're pure and they're whole because they belong to Jesus. And he died on the cross so that you can have them. And I want you to understand that. It wasn't part of the message this morning, but I need you to understand this. This is the simplicity of the gospel. That you and I don't have to walk around in guilt. I don't care how bad it's been. I don't care how bad you messed up. If you're in Christ this morning, you're clothed in his righteousness. Amen. And when you get a revelation of that Holy Spirit, oh, give us a revelation. Yes, Lord. Let us see it in our heart. Because when you can see that in your heart, and I, y'all can come to the front. When you can see that in your heart, you will begin to walk at a level of freedom because you won't be burdened under guilt anymore. Amen? Can you start to believe that? I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. Amen. I'm not guilty anymore. Amen. I'm not guilty. This is probably a bad illustration. I'm going to tell you this is a short time and a half. I watch the MZ and they fight sometimes. I had this girl that was fighting us. I don't even know what I was talking about. Some, some girls are, I've seen girls fight, you know, I'm just saying, I don't know that God's will that anybody fights. Anyway, <coughs> this is what I'm telling you to do. She kept saying, I'm the best. I'm the best. I'm the best. I'm the best. She said in the line, I'm the best. And this girl she was fighting was from China and she was another night. But that, that American chick kept it. I'm the best. I'm the best. And guess what? She walked away out of there with her belt still on her belt. That's a whole other thing. That's positive thinking and positive confession. But what I'm trying to say is this. You're not guilty. You can say that. You can say that in your heart of hearts and you know that that's the truth. I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. You're a liar. I'm not guilty. Why? How do you know you're not guilty? Not because my word says my Jesus died on the cross for my sin, and now I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That's what the word God says. I'm not walking around with ripped up garments no more. Hallelujah. I'm not guilty. I'm not guilty. And when you start to believe that, 
When you start to believe that, keep on playing that thing. When you start to believe that, <laughs> hallelujah, you're going to start feeling free. You're going to start feeling liberty. Hallelujah. Listen, I just want you to know the altar's up. They're going to close us out in the song. They're going to close us out in the song.